What's up, y'all? I'm on today with my new friend and author, Jillian Benfield. Her book, uh, The Gift of the Unexpected, came out about a year and a half ago, but I have um, been following her since uh, hearing her on some friends' podcasts and reading it, and she just spoke so much to my heart, my experience um, through the unexpected through suffering um, and whether you're kind of unexpected, is it like a big T tragedy or kind of just a, a hiccup or a hardship that you're going through right now, her mindset, her resilience, um, her fight for truth and hope um, and the, the gifts, the endless gifts that she now speaks about um, through her experience of learning of her her son's down syndrome diagnosis in the middle of her pregnancy to being 10 years out um and having him as this joyful incredible reminder of of the gifts of the unexpected of the gifts of god's love um it's just an amazing story her perspective is inspiring she talks a lot about um what she calls the unbecoming the power and the beauty of the unbecoming how the unexpected and hardship does that to us and then the resurrection that is available to us, not just resurrection in terms of eternal life, but resurrection that God works in our souls in the internal transformations um, for good that happen in us when we, when we choose to, in her words, undergo difficulty instead of just race to overcome it. This is packed with gold and wisdom, y'all. And, um, and I'm just so grateful to get to know her um, and to know her family and to know her faith and to know... Um, just the resilience and the joy and the gratitude that is possible even in life's most unexpected turns. So um, I know y'all are going to love Jillian. We had a great, great conversation. If you have not read her book or know her story, it is called The Gift of the Unexpected. Go get it. Listen in right now um, and enjoy this chat with my new friend, Jillian. All right, Jillian, thank you so much for being on Enjoy Life today. We were chatting before. We have a mutual friend from y'all's military life out West in Arizona. And it just, I don't know. I love those little God winks to just start like, you know, a new friend. It's kind of an old friend. So I'm just, I'm excited to get to know you after reading your book and following you for a while. And, uh, I'm really grateful for you taking time to share a little about your life and your family and your faith and all that with our people. So thanks yeah, for joining same, me. Same to you. I've, I've been following you for several years now because of that mutual friend of a friend. And um, yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. Also, my mother-in-law is very, very excited for me to be here today <laughs> as a side note. So how we love to start on the show, because I'm in Music City and um, music brings me joy, is if you had like a walkout song for your life, like oh. there was a song playing behind you right now, spring 2024, just kind of where you're at. What do, what do you think that song would be? You know, the one that immediately came to my mind is a little intense, but honestly, <laughs> kind of it got me through some events that happened after the book, which is actually what my second book is going to be more focused on. Um, and it's Even If by Mercy Me. That is one that that I really, yeah, just had to cling on to, you know, just when you've decided like what you believe and there's, you can Mm. grieve in your beliefs, you know, alongside your beliefs, but that that core belief is not really going to be shaken um, because you've already decided. And and that got me through many dark times. And I think ultimately it's a hopeful song. Yeah, I agree. It's, I know that one well, I, it was a big part of my grief journey too. And there's, there's like a sting in it, but then ultimately such a hope in it. Cause, cause the sting is like, even if you don't, that's kind of the, yeah. the tagline, right? Then my hope is you alone. And I love that. Yeah. I love that so much. Yeah. Um, well, just so people have the background of who you are, um, and, and what your first book, um, the gift of the unexpected is about came out January of 23. So like I said, I've been following you for a while. Um, you call it in the book your before and after moment, which I think is is very apt for people who've gone through any sort of unexpected tragedy. Um, can you just kind of take us back there? You're in your late twenties, and and this is a very unexpected before and after for you and your husband. Yeah, so I'll take you back to um, let's see, twenty twenty. 
oh gosh, not 2020. Um, I'll take you back to 2013, um, where my husband had just graduated dental school. We had just had our first child together and the military, um, to pay back dental school, we did a military scholarship. So the military was sending us across the country to Las Vegas, Nevada. And we had this great one year off. And I thought I was going to go right back to TV news when it was all done, uh, because I was a news anchor and reporter. Um, and then May 8th, 2014 rolled around and I get a phone call from my husband and he says, we're moving to Alamogordo, New Mexico. And my life, I thought at the time was turn up on its head because yeah. there wasn't even... Where is Alamogordo, New Mexico? <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> well, it's where they tested the first atomic bomb, if that yeah. gives you, uh, that paints a picture. Uh, but yeah, there wasn't um, even a target in Alamogordo at the time, let alone a TV news station. And so I just was crushed. And so much of my identity at the time was wrapped up in what I did. And I just, you know, it was this almost identity crisis that started to unfold. Um, but lo and behold, we get to Alamogordo and eight days after we arrive, it was time for my 20 week ultrasound because the same day that I found out that we were moving to Alamogordo, I also found out that I was pregnant <laughs> and we were yeah. not trying. And so it was just this whirlwind of a time and eight days after we arrived, it was time for an ultrasound. And I noticed that the ultrasound tech was taking a really long time to get the measurements. And finally, she flipped on the lights, thanked us, walked out the door. A nurse walked in and said, well, everything must look great because the doctor's not here. And as soon as she said that, he walked in and he explained to us that there were several markers on the ultrasound, did, uh, ultrasound that indicated that our child had a higher chance of having a trisomy. And I said, well, what does that mean? And he said, it means that your child has a higher chance of having a condition like Down syndrome. And I just remember my bra my back like breaking out in fire and the words, oh no, oh no, oh no, I, I can't be a special needs mom. I can't be a special needs mom. Just skipping over and over again in my head, like a, like a skipping CD. And finally we got some blood work done and we had to wait. And um, I think a, a little more than a week passed and my husband called me and he said, the doctor called, it's not good news, I'm coming home. And I just remember my heavy 20 week pregnant body just falling to the kitchen floor. And again, that skipping CD words were, were going in my head. It was, oh no, oh no, oh no, this can't be real. This can't be real. Mm. Uh, poor Violet, poor Violet um, was my immediate thought was of my daughter and how mm. this would affect her. Um, and then my husband came home and I followed him to the bathroom and I could tell he was going to be sick. And after he did get sick, I just remember him laying his head on my chest and his hot tears just rolling down my shirt. Um, we had just turned 27 years old and we were in shock that something like this could happen to us. Um, we knew the test came back positive for something, but we weren't sure what. And we had to go into the doctor to get the official diagnosis. All we knew was that it was life altering. It could be deadly. Um, but we weren't sure what it was. And finally, the doctor walked in and he said, well, it's not good news. Your child has a 99.9% .9 chance of having Down syndrome. And it's normally at times like these people want to talk about their options. Mm. And I said, uh, okay, what options? And he said, option one is you terminate the pregnancy. Uh, we don't do that here, but we'll, we'll set you up with somebody who can do it. I said, well, what's option two? And he said, option two is you continue your pregnancy with the high risk doctor. And he said, but don't worry, don't worry. You don't have to be a hero. You can, if you choose not to go through the termination, you can have the baby here and we can keep the baby comfortable, but you don't, we don't have to do anything drastic to save his life. Mm. So in other words, the doctor led me to believe that our child would not have a life worth living. Mm. And so... I really grieved as if a death had mm. taken place. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and how old's your son now? Not to skip to the, I want to skip to the happy ending. So everybody <laughs> knows. Um, he's, he's nine years old now. Yeah. And just what's so beautiful. I mean, it's, it's endless. The things I love about your book, but what's beautiful is you're so honest about that grief before 
he was even born before he was even a part of your family. And, and a lot of that grief, you know, is, is so multifaceted in what is this going to be like for him? What is this going to be like? You mentioned for your daughter, Violet, like, what is this going to be like for us? And then that sort of added layer of grief, um, that you talk about really vulnerably and I know had to be hard to share, um, which was the grief that you've said in your own words, like you had a little more in common with the doctor than you wanted to admit. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Like, what were those feelings early on? Yeah, I think those early on feelings were that my ideas of what made a good life were mm. more in line with the doctor than what I would say would be more in line with what God wants for us. Mm -hmm. um, I thought the makings of the good life, I thought that success equaled a good life. Success equaled a worthy life. And so if my son couldn't succeed in the way that I thought uh, we were all meant to succeed, you know, in this very American dream type way, um, mm -hmm. then how could he live a good and worthy life? And so what grieving looked like for me and, and a big premise of my book is that I encourage people to not try to overcome the unexpected, but to undergo it instead. And what I mean by that is if you, if you Google image the word overcome, you're going to see a person standing atop a mountain with their arms stretched overhead and a stance that just screams victory, right? That's the yeah. image that we have. Um, but if you Google image the word undergo, you're going to find somebody who's about to undergo surgery. And that's mm -hmm. really what I mean, that when grief comes, when the unexpected comes, I think that we have to admit that we need help, seek out that mm -hmm. help, and then dig into those deep, dark spaces and confront the pain and then pursue healing after. And when I went through that process, that's when I realized that my view of life, that my view of God, that my view of um, worth, including my own, needed a lot of work. Yeah. And and I wonder, was, was your natural bend, like, was your natural tendency more toward the overcome than the undergo? Like, did this take really active yeah. effort for you to choose, no, I'm going to... I'm going to feel this. I'm going to grieve this. I'm going to be honest. Absolutely. That's how I yeah. am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what your Enneagram type is, but I'm a three. Yeah. And so yeah. I think, yeah, I think for achiever types um, might especially more bend towards that, right? Like I, I'm going to push through this and I'm, I'm going to put on a happy face mm -hmm. and I'm going to pretend my way almost out of this in a way I think was kind of my natural bend mm. towards things before this happened. But to be honest with you, the grief was so thick and so unexpected and just never something I had envisioned for my life that I really had no choice yeah. but to sit under it. And that really was a gift. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think I also, like you, had sort of mastered this kind of idea of reframing or spinning or, or just focusing on the silver lining kind of thing. And when I'd had rough patches in life and, and I'm interested in your thoughts because there still is an element of that. That's good, right? Like we don't want to give up hope. We don't want to spend every moment only grieving or only as you talk about on the bathroom floor, which I would love to kind of go back to that space. Um, we have to hold the hope, right? We have to claim, promises that we believe as God's children and, and that he can restore and redeem and all these things that are themes throughout your story. Um, but also holding strictly those pushes us towards this side of, like you said, it's a denial of reality. It's a toxic positivity. You talk about in the book, like how we culturally are sort of trained toward that, whether it's our, you know, Enneagram type or not. And, and that we have to break up with this toxic positivity. Um, and so I, I know what it feels like to try to try to balance those things. And, and so I appreciate you being so honest about like, there is a genuineness to wanting to hope, right? But there's a point at which that hope 
turns toxic or that hope turns, you know, into denial and that that is never going to get you to the place where you can truly heal because until we grieve, until we, we embrace the bathroom floor kind of thing, you know, that we're ignoring the depth of the brokenness. And if we don't acknowledge it, then, then God can't heal it and we can't move forward. And, and so like, I wonder, I guess, obviously culturally that's kind of our Ben. you said you google you know overcoming everybody wants to be the the woman on the top of the mountain and in a way we are at some point right but like was your was your faith part of that ben too not just your wiring and enneagram in the culture you talk a lot about your childhood faith versus this faith that you've since grown into um was that part of sort of this compulsion to i don't know find a silver lining yeah, I think, you know, my faith was very young at that point. And I I had this idea and I don't I don't know exactly why I had this idea, but I think it has to do with like the American dream kind of marrying um the Christian faith in this side of on this side of the world mm-hmm. where um you know, if you work hard enough uh, then you can achieve whatever you want. And somehow we get that intertwined with the gospel message. And that is, that's just not no. uh, the gospel message. <laughs> you know, um, when the worst thing happened to the best person who ever lived on earth, which I would argue would be Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not really sure how we got it misconstrued that um, bad things won't happen to good people. Um, and so that was a, a lot of unpacking. But when it comes to, the um the hope within the grief i would say what really allowed me to sit in both grief and sit in hope was getting acquainted with not shiny jesus ascending from a hill but from jesus who came here as a baby poor Mm. no titles to his name um acquainted with Jesus, not only of the resurrection, but Jesus who was persecuted and suffered the most horrible death. When I got in touch with that Jesus who came here to suffer with us and as us and for us, that allowed me to hold both the real grief in one hand and the real hope Mm. that the resurrection brings. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that is the kind of faith that restores, right? Because in a way, just that mountaintop shiny Jesus, like it's comforting when we don't need comfort, but like, that's not, that's not even the Jesus that I, I don't want to say wanted, like you want Jesus in any form, but that's not the Jesus that I needed. You know, when I was broken, Mm -hmm. I needed the one that was persecuted and the one that wept and the one that felt hurt by other people. And, and that was, that was the, the Jesus that I needed beside me in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that that's really, that's like where the depths of our faith are developed in a lot of ways. I I sense that in your story, like that is one of the gifts of the unexpected. And um, I think one of the other gifts I referenced before is, is kind of in online with this topic is the ability to, I don't want to say be thankful for, but honor the bathroom floor moments. Um, can you just kind of speak to what that meant to you? Like for people who may be on the bathroom floor, just kind of like in the depths and the trenches, kind of walk through what that meant to you in the book and, and maybe speak a little encouragement <laughs> into the people who are heard there in this moment. Yeah. You know, I think for me, I had lived my life wearing multiple pieces of armor. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, that armor was achievement and doing things that other would find admirable. I think that armor was um, not letting myself get too close to too many people, you know, because I wanted this shiny image of myself out there. And when we have these moments that, in my case, literally brought me to the bathroom floor um, where I just had to really sit under the weight of what had happened and how my life was going to change. And even though at the time I didn't know how much I didn't know, 
uh, that moment was still so crucial because it really opened me up to my own pain and it allowed me to really become more vulnerable than I had ever been. Mm -hmm. And that in a way lets the light in, in a different way than, um, than I had ever experienced. You know, I, I think that sometimes I stood in this false light, you know, the spotlight, literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think no matter what you do, you can probably relate to that. And I think that the bathroom floor sitting in that darkness made space for real light to get in. Um, and that was through the path of vulnerability. Um, because there was, there was no armor on the bathroom floor. I was literally sitting there naked. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a spiritual sense too, you know, everything had to go, everything had to be shed. Mm -hmm. Um, and it allowed, um, you know, it was really the beginning. I didn't know it then, but it was the beginning of transformation. Yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes you have in the book is from Richard Rohr, who is kind of the Enneagram Godfather guy that says the two paths to transformation are great love and great suffering. And mm -hmm. in your story, I feel like those, you experienced both of those in tandem in a really fragile, tender, transformative way. And, and your kind of words of the bathroom floor, this really raw honesty about pain and learning to put down the armor, like the result of that was unbecoming. I think that's such a cool and, and very, um, astute way to describe what happens when we allow ourselves to be broken, um, by suffering, by the unexpected, and then sort of the rest of the book in your re-becoming in different ways, your regrowth, your renewal. Um, and yeah. so I wonder like this Jillian kind of on the other side of your unbecoming and, and becoming like, is she totally new or do you see parts of, of young you or childhood you kind of being restored? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, no, she's not totally new. Yeah. I think the way that God works in our transformation is that he, when we become broken by the unexpected, I think that he sweeps away pieces that need to be swept away and he adds in new ones. And the, the picture of that is, is something familiar and also something new. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think that is even demonstrated in the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus comes back, he wasn't recognized. The disciples did not recognize him. Mm -hmm. Something about him was different and also the same. And I think that is, the, that is how our transformations go to, you know, our parts of our core selves and our personalities, you know, they're never going to go away and neither should they, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, God designed us in such a way to be who he wanted us to be. Yeah. But what I think transformation through the unexpected, what I think it does is that it helps us to live into our fullest version of ourselves that God dreamed up a long time ago. Um, and so I do, I think I'm living it at my fullest version. No, because I think transformation is a lifelong process, mm -hmm. but do I think that I am closer to that fullest version of myself now, having been through the unexpected? Absolutely. Um, and you know, I think really where there's hope in that is, you know, you and I both know this just because the unexpected happened once doesn't mean it won't happen again. You know, I mean, that's just the hard truth of being a real, uh, of being a human. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not immune from the unexpected to happen again. And truth be told, the story um, focused on my son with Down syndrome and, and that, that part of my story. But shortly after, I ended up having a miscarriage. And shortly after that, I ended up getting pregnant again. And that baby ended up having a whole health host of health issues. Mm. Um and although he is very healthy now, um, that part of my story was also very painful and very difficult, but I was already living into a self that was transforming. Mm -hmm. And I already knew that God could sweep away more pieces and add in new, new pieces. And there's always hope in that there's hope in the transformation that can come with our lives with God, no matter what life brings our way. Yeah, that's so true. Um, the sweeping away is a good image. And and you've referenced many times this sort of 
wrong perception of worth being success, being achievement, um, being those normal sort of, you know, benchmarkers for a, for a quote unquote good life that we all sort of, I think, adopt yeah. without question until, you know, we have a reason to. And, and so I, I just personally wonder as a mom of typically developing kids of a son with down syndrome, um, how do we, how do we teach our kids those right values, right? Like that worth and, and value and purpose, um, is ultimately only from God and his creation of us and his intention of us, but also like celebrate when they do things well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm about to have a baby. And for me, like I'm wired like you, I'm like, I want to cheer them on for everything they do yeah. and, and all that they achieve, but I don't want to wire that into them. You know, that seems I know. impossible. It is really hard. You know, I have a daughter who, I mean, she's just this phenomenal little actress and she's yeah. a singer like I was. And it is hard not to give her attention for that because yeah. she deserves it. She works so hard. She is in her room every night practicing, you know, and these are things worthy of our attention. But I, this is something I don't have a perfect answer for. I just try to, um, you know, rejoice with her and mm. all of her accomplishments and tell her how proud I am of her and also say that there is nothing you can do mm. that will add to your worth. And there is nothing you can do to take it away. Although what you do on the stage is incredible, mm -hmm. it doesn't make you a more worthy person. And to be honest, that is a little bit easier for me as a parent, having her brother with Down syndrome in our mm -hmm. house. You know, we mm -hmm. have a lot of conversations about him. Like, look at Anderson. He yeah. is just as worthy to God, to this world as you are. Um, and yet he can't get on stage and do what you do. And he can't, you know, get an A in his class and do I love him any less? No. So if I don't love him any less for what he can or cannot do, you know, how much more does God feel that way about you? There's nothing you can do to be more loved than you already are. Yeah. And so I just try to speak that into her while also, you know, praising her for her for accomplishments. Sure. And I hope I'm doing it right. I'm sure I'm getting, I'm not getting it perfect, but that's, that's my hope. <laughs> no, listen, that sounds good to me. I, I don't know what else you could possibly do, but just speak both of those things truthfully, you know? And, um, and I wonder too, like the kind of opposite side of that coin, this whole conversation kind of comes back down to what has to be stripped away for us to really believe that our worth is strictly our identity in Christ, right? Like we hear that a lot. I feel like this has been sort of a refrain with people I've talked to lately is I know what that means. Like that's the church answer. Like we know that our identity yeah. in Christ defines all of our value. It's the only thing that is eternal and won't fall away. And but like, what is that? How do we practically live that? You know what I mean? Like when you sort of had this stripping away, when you have days that I'm sure those sort of metrics for value for you, value for Anderson, value for any of your kids, like creeps back in, like what helps mm -hmm. you kind of revert back to, no, this is like God, God, what God says of me is my metric for people who are like, I get it, but I still can't break out of this cycle of, of comparison or achievement or pain or discouragement or whatever? Like, is there, do you have a little sniffing salt or something that helps you? <laughs> I wish I did. I yeah. wish it was that Can easy. We buy it? You know, I, I have found myself, it's funny because I have found myself, um, in cycles with this, mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely better than it was. And then, uh, you know, then it will be book sales, right? And then you start mm -hmm. equating that to your worth. And then you're like, I, I, that part I have been able to push out of my mind. And then it, then it transfers over to something else that's totally not okay at all, like body image stuff and like, mm -hmm. oh, I got to be more fit or whatever. So, you know, I have been through all of this and I believe what I wrote, but it is still hard for me to live that out all the yeah. time. Um, and, but, but I will say is that I always go back to Anderson. Um, you know, and I know not everybody is blessed enough <laughs> to have a child with a disability or somebody with a disability in your life. But, um, you know, I feel like God speaks to us in all sorts of ways. I think he speaks to us through the Bible. Obviously, I think he speaks to us through nature. For me, God speaks to me through my son. Hmm. I think that's where I feel him the most. And I feel the message of God and Jesus and what he came here to do and how in our weaknesses, 
those are actually our strengths. And so when I feel myself tempted to get back into that cycle of, no, I got to do this more. I got to do this more. Um, I look at Anderson and say, he's enough. Yeah. That means I'm enough too. And um, yeah, so I do have a little built-in teacher over here. <laughs> That's that <helps>. amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, well, one big kind of topic that I'm really anxious to hear from you on is your idea of blueprints that uh, is throughout mm. the book. Uh, I've since learned, I think your brother-in-law is an architect. So this made sense. You he's had he's an engineer, engineer who helped me. I was on the phone with him a bunch. Like, yeah. okay, explain this process Fact to check. me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tell us what that metaphor meant to you in the book, kind of this overarching question um, that kind of led you to using that to explore um, as you wrote, as you grieved, as you as you healed. It's, it's a beautiful yeah. picture. Gosh, you know, I think you're the first person to ask me about this. So this is a this is a fresh answer. All for right. Me. Um, so um, when I first wrote the first version of this book that ultimately was rejected um, by publishers, really what I was motivated by was was Anderson always meant to have Down syndrome? Was I was this always meant to be a part of my story? Because disability is complicated, right? I have come to look at Anderson's condition as um, really more of a gift. It, it is, you can't take Down syndrome away from him. He wouldn't be the same person. Mm -hmm. um, I think that his identity is, is wrapped up in his disability. And yet he has suffered because of that disability in a very tangible way. What I mean by that is he ended up having to have open heart surgery and heart defects are very common with people with Down syndrome. So if I believe in a God who doesn't cause suffering, then how could I believe in a God that causes Down syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. That's That was what led me on the first round yeah, of this book. For sure. Do I have the answer for you? No, <laughs> I do not. But what I did land on was that a blueprint is like this very exact structure and there's no changes that can be made to a blueprint. What Once it is set, that's what builders go off of. It's, it's done. But nowadays, they don't use blueprints. They use something called an as-built. And I hope I get this right. And I hope there's no engineers <laughs> listening right now. I won't know. Because it's been a while. It, so. <laughs> but, but basically, that, um, you know, the, the documents, that what they use now can be edited, right? They're, they have more flexibility. And at the end of the project, they hand in a new document called an, called an as built. And it shows what they had to add to the original design in order to adapt to unexpected elements, right? And that is more of how I look at my life and unexpected things and even tragic things that have happened. It's not that necessarily that God, uh, let me use my youngest son more of an, I feel like yep. he's a better example in this. Um, not that God caused him to have this really difficult and possibly deadly condition that he had. Um, but what we have done in response to that condition, um, that uh, God kind of helps us to adapt to what life throws at our way. Right. And um, so that is that's kind of where I landed. But mm -hmm. I, I leave it very open handed. You know, in another interview, um, the podcaster asked me, he was like, all right, I'm going to drill you on this. You know, you said <laughs> that asking why is really important. And he's like, and I don't know if I agree with that. And I said, you know, I do think asking why is important because it is important to to get a basis of what we believe and mm -hmm. how we believe God is involved in our lives, especially in our sufferings. I said, but where I have come to, I hold it all with very open hands. I know that I'm never going to have the corner on God's truth. Mm -hmm. um, and neither will you and neither will anyone listening. Um, so that's, that's where I've come is that I believe that things I, really how I concluded the book is that, you know, I think there's three authors in life and that's God gets a pen and he wrote, you know, what he his highest desires for us a long time ago. Um, we get a pen and how we're going to write our own stories and hopefully those fit in with God and life gets a pen. And that means, you know, those things that we just never expected to happen, the 
the tragic car accident, you know, what have you, the, the illness, um, and how are we going to adapt our pins and our stories to what has happened to us? Um, that's what ends up mattering. And I think that God is with us through that process. Mm, yeah, I, that's, it's such a complicated topic. And I just, I applaud you for just honestly breaching it, like not trying to get a pretty bow answer. Um, because I think it is in the why that we just, we find a real version of God that, like you said, isn't the shiny version. There's no real conclusion, but there is so much love and so much, I think, intimacy. Like I felt God intimately in my story when I asked the why questions and, and to be honest, didn't really get mm -hmm. sufficient answers. Like, I don't think we get sufficient, clear answers a lot because as you sort of state, over and over in this conversation in the book is that God is purposefully mysterious. And, and mm -hmm. I appreciate your acknowledging that and that wording, and it's not to deceive. It's not, you know, to confuse. It's just almost maybe even to draw us more in, in relationship and like draw us more in to keeping him invited to every page of our story. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know what that purpose yeah. behind the mystery is, but it's clear when you go through this sort of suffering and really bravely walk it with him that at least for me, you, you, you get less answers than you want, but you get more yeah. of him than you, than you bargain for, if, if that makes sense. And like, that's that in really and of good. Itself is a huge gift. I mean, yeah. it's the gift, right? It's true. I, I think in the wrestling um, I heard somebody say this once it's, uh, I think I can't remember who it was, but in the wrestling, it's an intimate process, mm, yeah. right? And so if you are asking those hard questions, those why questions, I think you get to know the person who made you better. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you get all the answers? No, but you know, ultimately where I have landed, what, what I would want your listeners to take away from anything more than I could say is that where no matter what God's involvement is in our present hard circumstances, what I do believe God promises is resurrection. Mm, yeah, yeah. And that doesn't just mean at the end of our lives and what happens to us at the end of our lives. I believe the resurrection is a promise to us in this life, in and mm. out and over again. And one of my favorite examples to illustrate this was when we were living in Alamogordo there were these gorgeous white sands there, okay? It was like the one amazing thing about <laughs> Alamogordo were these white sands. And to just look at them, they, they were beautiful, right? But if you look beneath them and, and go deeper into their story, they're really a product of death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. You know, they there used to be this huge lake that covered that whole area and the lake dried up and it left this gypsum behind and then the wind came and storms came and it broke that gypsum down. And what we have left is this beautiful sight of these rolling white hills today. And I think that is what happens to us in our lives so often if we're willing to participate in that resurrection process. What we have lost may never come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But through resurrection, God breathes new life into us and we can become new through it. And our unexpected circumstances may not always be a gift. They yeah. may not. Yeah. Uh, my, my situation with my son with Down syndrome is different because I have come to think about Down syndrome so differently. But I've had other circumstances that I cannot say are a gift. For sure. But what I can say is that there is a gift in the unexpected if only it is a change that happens from within mm -hmm. and that we can become new through the unexpected with the gift of the resurrection that God offers to each of us. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And where this, this is May, probably when people are listening, but we're right after Easter when we're having this conversation. So this idea of resurrection is so fresh in my mind and just it means so much to hear you say like, yes, it is. It is the, it is the biblical salvation resurrection that we celebrated on Easter, but like we can have that every day and every season 
with God, when we bravely undergo, when we embrace the gifts, not necessarily that the, the tragedies are, but the gifts that come through that undergoing of the tragedy. And one of the ways that you kind of speak about resurrection in, in the book is referencing that the way that the disciples then recognize Jesus, you mentioned they don't at first, is by his scars. And that there's a reason those aren't wiped away when he's resurrected. There's a reason that they remain and, and just your honest sort of desire that your scars show something to the world. And I think that's beautiful. Like, because for so long, I will be the first to admit, like, I didn't want those scars. Like I didn't want to use the word widow. I didn't want that to be a permanent part of my story. And as they became actual scars and not open wounds, I realize exactly what you're saying is like these scars become a beautiful way that we witness to what God does. And so mm -hmm. I'm just, I hope mm -hmm. people are encouraged by that because when they are open gaping wounds, they don't feel like beautiful scars and that's okay. And they're not, the, the reason they're there wasn't necessarily good, but that there is a tremendous amount of good that they can reveal and, and hope that they can, you know, speak into somebody else's life. And so I just, I want to thank you for sharing your scars. I think this is so necessary and so hopeful and, and especially for people who have walked this exact path of, of grieving for their kids um, and grieving for their family, just to see your joy and your gratitude for it. Um, it is so beautiful. So I'm just thankful and and I'm thankful for all three of your wonderful kids who are so precious. I love seeing them on social media <laughs> and, and just, I don't know, the way that you have lived into the unexpected is really amazing and, um, and, and drawn such purpose from it. I think the one, the one kind of thing I, I would love to land at is you talked a lot about internal transformations and, and purpose. And, uh, and I wonder like for people who are in a place where they think, how could there ever be purpose from this? Um, how could this ever matter? What would that even look like? Was that a thing that you prayed for or like actively kind of sought out or did that purpose kind of just find you? I mean, you know, what do they do? <laughs> you know, looking back at journals, once Anderson was born, I feel like that I was desperate. I was desperate for meaning to come out of this. I had already experienced some, obviously some internal transformation was happening, but I just, I knew there was something else that I was supposed to be doing with it. Mm -hmm. um, not that, not that every transformation has to be monetized because <laughs> right, right. that's not what I'm getting at. Um, or, or put into like a concrete action. Um, but I do think that our internal transformations, when we are really internally transformed, it flows through us, right? And, you know, for me, that has come in the form of writing and speaking and hopefully feeling, helping people um, see that transformation is possible through the unexpected. And gratitude is possible through the unexpected, which is where the next book is heading. Yes. Um, that's where, you know, I landed, but I have seen also amazing transformations come um, from other people I have known who have been hit by the unexpected through works of deep rooted advocacy mm -hmm. um, and also really quiet work too. You know, you know, those people who just listen to you better. Mm -hmm. and just make yeah. you feel so seen. Those people have been through something, you know, they, that sure. might be part of their natural gifting, but those people who really just make you feel seen and embrace you and, mm -hmm. and are there for you, those are people that have seen some things in life. Yeah. And I have seen just beautiful purpose come from the unexpected in, in many different ways. And I think that's available to, to all of us once we do the hard work of undergoing. Yeah. I love that you say that, this sort of quiet purpose in that, there is a really, there's a beautiful tenderness that, that comes from a lot of mm -hmm. us that go through this suffering. And I would trade it for anything, to be honest. Um, I had yeah. quite a few hard edges that needed to be softened and, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. I'm grateful for yes. that. Um, 
kind of one last thing I want to hear from you. And this isn't a, this isn't a deep dive question, but, um, I just, I, I admired so much throughout the book, the way that you wrote about kind of yours and your husband, Andy's, um, relationship and partnership through this really stressful, very difficult, um, challenging time. And, and mm -hmm. you just write about one another with such gentleness and strength kind of in, in that, what that takes in a marriage when you endure hardship and mm -hmm. suffering. And so I want to applaud you for that just, and say, thank you for those of us who, you know, are new in marriage or haven't gone through something difficult or for those who are in the trenches of trial. And, and so I want to say thank you. And I also want to ask, you know, what, what kind of helped you to fuse together or turn together more than pull apart? Cause I know that's a very real and very common trajectory mm -hmm. in these seasons is you can either cling tighter or really kind of turn your backs. It's so true. It's, it's true. I, you know, I do think it is by the grace of God that that wasn't our story. Um, and that our story was one where we became more fused together. Um, you know, and, and really something at the time that I was very resentful towards God about was after Alan McGordo, we got stationed in Tucson, um, uh, which is further West and all of our family is on, is in Florida and Georgia. So we were moving further away from family and really ended up being a gift because we couldn't rely on anyone else. Mm -hmm. You know, when you are, when you are plunked into a new city, um, it's, it takes, I know this is a military spouse. It takes six months to make a friend, Wow. <laughs> you know? Um, and I would say a year before that friend is like really a real true mm -hmm. friend, maybe even a year and a half. And so we were all we had. And if I were to give any tangible advice is that we fed off of each other really well. Mm -hmm. Like when somebody was really down in the dumps, the other person would carry them through that evening, you know, like I'll do the dishes, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we had each other's backs and when, and when the other was down the dumps, the other did that. And I feel like we did a good job of, saying, I have to talk this out right now. Um, and I was more of the external processor. And so Andy would have to listen to me. And mm -hmm. I would also need to know he was more of an internal processor and he needed space. Mm -hmm. And so I think we just met each other. We dealt with things very differently, but we met each other where we were. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think as we continue to live and go through, you know, we're in a great phase right now. And even in this great phase there, this has been a really difficult school year with our child with sure. Down syndrome. And one of our other children too has gone through some things. And um, so I, I think we do a really good job because of our experience through the unexpected of meeting each other where we are instead of meeting each other where we are. Does that yeah, make sense? Like instead sure. of responding to you the way I want you to respond to me, I'm going to respond to you the way that I believe you want that yeah. you need me to. Um, and yeah. so if I were to give any tangible advice, that's what I would say. Um, but I would say, and I just, if you can, when you start walking that unexpected road, just try to hold on to each other tighter mm. and to invest in each other more because nobody's going to know what you are going through at that level, except mm -hmm. your partner. You know, um, or the person closest to you, but in this instance, we're talking about marriage. So that your partner is is really um, can be such a gift. It can be. It can be if if you meet each other with such tender and care and just invest, use it as a time as an of investment. And mm. it, for us, it really did pay off. Yeah, that's a good word because investment, you know, implies sacrifice a lot of the time, and that's what you kind of yeah. have to do. Is you said sacrifice the way that you would want things to be done or handled or communicated to then serve them in the way that they need and vice versa. And y'all just paint a really pretty picture of that. And I'm very thankful. Um, and I hope some people who are fighting for that connection right now feel encouraged by that. I know they do. So I hope so. I hope I, I didn't gloss over anything because I, I don't want to imply that it's easy or that we have a perfect marriage, no, but no, no. we have been, Honestly, that is a way that the unexpected has been a gift to us mm. is that we've become closer than I ever thought possible. Mm, that's beautiful. 
Well, that is sort of, I mean, that is the, the title and truly heartbeat of your book is that there are gifts and, and seemingly endless ones, even in these really unexpected seasons of trial. And so I appreciate you being that, that voice for the world and, and your story and your family. Um, if anyone hasn't read Jillian's book, The Gift of the Unexpected, please go get it. You do the audio book, which I listen to too. I love to hear the authors tell the stories. Um, and it's so lovely. And and I feel like people are only getting even a glimpse of everything you dive into. You're a wonderful writer. And, and just really honest, this is not, there's not a pretty bow in this. And I hope you hear that as a compliment. This is really an invitation for people who are struggling. Um, and also a big banner of hope for people who are struggling. So I'm, I'm grateful Thank for that. You. And um, Thank you for yeah, that. and I'm just so grateful to get to know you a little bit more. And, and um, because the show is about joy, um, even in the unexpected and in the hardness of your story, um, I want to know just what's a thing that is bringing you guys joy right now. Mm. Fridays. <laughs> Love Fridays. It. My, um, my husband uh, is now a private practice orthodontist and he doesn't work on Fridays. And so um, we have a couple of hours of kid-free time on Fridays and we now live in Florida and we, every time that we can do this, if the weather is permits, we go walk the beach with mm. coffee and uh, it's my favorite part of the week and it just helps us, you know, it's, it, not to Christianize it too much, but it's almost like this holy space, mm -hmm. you know, of just this time of pouring into each other. And also just like, I don't know, God's just so present at the beach for me. And um, yeah, so Fridays bring me joy. I agree. Friday at the beach. I don't know where you could find more joy, to be honest. Um, I'm glad y'all <laughs> are back in Florida and kind of back home for you. But you. Jillian, where can everybody find you? And if you can give new info on your latest book, please do. If you can't, I understand. We'll keep our eyes open. Yeah, it's a ways off. I'm still okay. in the writing process, but I can tell you that it's going to be, it's the title has already been out there um, with different publications that have come out. So it's going to be called Overwhelmed and Grateful. And it's mm, about the concept of and, mm -hmm. um, and how, again, how we talked about like living with grief and living with hope. And what does that actually look like um, in all phases of life, whether you're grieving or just going through normal life stuff like we yeah. are right now. Um, so that's not going to be until August 2025, though. So anyway, hold on to that. Um, but I am on Facebook at Jillian Benfield and Instagram at Jillian Benfield blog. I have couple free eBooks on my website, JillianBenfield.com. Awesome. And those will sign you up for my newsletter, which is uh, a lot of fun, although not as active as regular because of the writing of the book. As you yeah. know, it just, it just takes it all out of me. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, y'all go follow Jillian, get the book. Like I said, if you haven't read it, um, or listen to it and I just appreciate you sister. This is, uh, exactly the kind of story and the kind of friends that I want. Um, our enjoy family to know. So I'm grateful and, and just wish you and your beautiful family, the most wonderful Fridays coming up this spring and summer before it's too hot in Florida for y'all. So just thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. This has just been really, really such a, a blessing to do today. And I've um, been wanting to meet you and I'm just so glad that you reached out and very thankful. So thank you. Good. Well, you have been a gift to all of us. I know everybody feels the same as I do. So we appreciate you. Thank you.